Next on Gallery, a musician builds his orchestra in his backyard and then teaches us how anyone can play an instrument. In high school, I, I was going to some folk festivals, and I ran into a gent who was playing a, a funny little box banjo made out of a redwood box that he put a neck on, and it sounded decent. I was amazed, and he said, eh, anybody can make this. But there it is. You see, it's pretty rudimentary. It's really a, a redwood uh, box, probably for cigars, and with a neck. But that worked, and the book that I learned how to fret it from uh, talked about building dulcimers, and I had never heard of a dulcimer before, and I built a dulcimer, and somebody saw it, asked me to make them one, and um, I just kept doing it. <laughs> so this is the top of one of my octave dulcimers, and you can see that the fingerboard area here is hollow, and that makes the top lighter and vibrates better. Um, not everybody does that. Some people use solid sticks on their instruments, but that definitely uh, decreases the, the sound capacity of it. I've got a jig here that perfectly matches this, and this just settles right on top of that. And the important part of that is that it supports this fingerboard for this process, which is putting in these metal frets. Uh, they're the things that actually where the rubber meets the road on getting the right note on an instrument. So you want them in the right place and you, and you want them nice and level. So once we get all these set up in their slots, come over to the drill press here that's not being used as a drill press but merely a press at this point. And I've got a little, what's known as a call. It distributes pressure. And you look at that and go, and it just pops it right down into that slot. I'm uh, actually in the process of prototyping these little octave dulcimers. These play in a mandolin range, pretty much, and uh, are an octave above a normal dulcimer. And one of the things I've discovered about it that's really quite fun, I mean, I knew these would be very portable and you can sit them in your lap and play them, but um, in spite of being small, you can play chop chords on it. And they're re it really sounds loud. It's the way a mandolin plays. And when I'm in a group of mixed instruments playing, you can hear one of these little tiny dulcimers better than you can hear a normal dulcimer. And this critter over here is unusual. I'm actually the only one that makes these. I... Uh, got into boat building for a while, and when I came back to dulcimer making, I just couldn't resist making one shaped like a boat. I actually used boat design software, and it's, uh, I was hoping that we would, we would uh, get the reputation of a lute, and I wanted to call it a lute simmer, but what I actually caught on was boat simmer. <laughs> so it goes. That gives an example of how distinct gourd banjos are from regular banjos. They're softer, they're rounder, it's almost a classical guitar sound versus a steel string guitar sound. This the instrument doesn't look very precise. It looks like a stick and a gourd and some skin, and in some ways that's true, but uh, it can be done well and it can be done badly. When it's done badly, they don't play. It is basically made from a regular field gourd, and then they're dried, and we saw the lid off here and uh, use some implements of destruction to hollow all the stuff out of it. It's a little bit like cleaning out a pumpkin. And uh, then it gets uh, sanded flat on some sandpaper. And then it's important to put some strategic holes in it. This is a jig that I created that uses a, a dedicated drill there that's all leveled and, and attached in. And then the, the gourd is strapped down to this little carriage that slides in here. And it drills that hole very accurately. And then you pick it up and you turn it around and it drills this next hole like so. The skin is a big part of it, uh, and it's, uh, I use calf skin, you can use goat skin too. Uh, they start out like this, and you soak them, and there's a, several different ways to attach the skins. This one is probably one of the more traditional ways, and that is with uh, regular tacks. So you stretch them over it and pound them into it. It works fine, uh, in, including the fact that it's fairly humid out, but uh, the action's lower. The strings are closer to the neck on a humid day than they are on a dry day. And people solve that problem by carrying a bunch of different height bridges <laughs> with them. So you've got the, the gourd, you've got a skin on it, um, which, which is what causes the amplification of the strings. But you need to control the strings, and that's uh, by putting an, a neck precisely on this gourd. This one, as I said, has a dowel that runs through it. Um, and that dowel runs into a hole in the base of the neck, like so. And what you use for tuners are, um, well, in our modern case, we often use violin, uh, ebony violin pegs. And they're really effective, and you don't have to make them from scratch, which is an advantage. So you use uh, these ebony pegs and a reamer. This is a precise tool that's made for the, uh, uh, the violin industry, and you actually uh, use it to enlarge 
these holes. This is made specifically to match the taper of the pegs that are going to fit in that hole. People sometimes don't even think about where instruments come from, they just appreciate them and that's fine, but there is a process that, that people commit themselves to if they do it for a living. On these little ones that I've started making, these little octave dulcimers, I, I always put a card in there that, that gives some details on, on where and when it was made, but I, I usually put a line from poetry or sometimes from one of my songs in it. And these will, are things that will probably never, <laughs> never be read. So yeah, there's a, a sense of legacy, you know, it's a short dance here. And oddly enough, as, as impermanent as these things are, they're going to outlast us, which is a strange notion in itself. <laughs>